Welcome. This video explains how an air conditioner works to include providing the nomenclatures and functions of its parts, description of its refrigerant, and the applicable portions of the second law of thermodynamics and the ideal gas law, which determine its cooling and heat transfer capabilities. In episode 27, I showed how to change a bad air conditioner condenser fan motor and how I saved more than $1,000 doing it by myself in lieu of paying an expensive HVAC contractor to do the job. Episode 29 draws on your knowledge gained from this video on how an air conditioner works and covers the 10 most common air conditioner problems that you'll most likely encounter. The episode also provides my recommendations for repairing them. For three and a half years while attending high school in Eagle, Colorado, I worked for a small family owned refrigeration and air conditioning company. I worked full time during four summers and continued working on the weekends and school holidays during the school year. I started by cleaning and sweeping the shop and helped deliver repaired refrigerators and air conditioners. Noticing that I was working very hard, the owner taught me the theory of refrigeration and how to troubleshoot and repair refrigerators and air conditioners. Approximately two years into the job, I could troubleshoot and repair most of the refrigerators and air conditioners that came into our shop. This included changing motor compressors, silver soldering refrigeration line connections, evacuating refrigeration and air conditioning systems, and charging them with new Freon refrigerant. It was a great job for me as a high school student, and I really appreciated its challenges and responsibilities. In addition, I had a 53 Chevy that my father helped me repair to include rebuilding its engine. If the car didn't run, I walked, so it was very important for me to keep it running. I wanted to take high school automotive shop, but my dad insisted that I concentrate on college prep courses. Nonetheless, while helping repair my car, my father taught me how an internal combustion engine works. Soon thereafter, I received an appointment to West Point. As a cadet, I uniquely looked forward to taking our engineering thermodynamics course because it addressed my high school refrigeration and automotive power plant hands-on technical experiences. We studied the thermodynamics theory and design of internal combustion engines, heat engines, turbine engines, diesel engines, and refrigerators and air conditioners. This includes the applications of the second law of thermodynamics and the ideal lock gas law to refrigeration and air conditioning, which I'll soon explain. The rest of this episode focuses on the simple schematic on how an air conditioner works. In short, an air conditioner removes the heat from the inside of your house, which is depicted by this dashed line, and displaces it to the outside surrounding air. Starting from the bottom left hand corner, this schematic includes a refrigerator motor compressor which is housed in the bottom center of this outside condenser. It also includes a picture of an air conditioner condenser and a schematic drawing of its internal condenser coils which actually align the perimeter wall of the condenser in the photograph. The condenser coil line continues running inside to the house, most likely through your basement or crawl space to this expansion valve which is located near the air conditioner's evaporator. The evaporator on the left is housed in the evaporator case on the right which is normally mounted above your furnace unit in the basement. The coil line leaves the expansion valve, enters the evaporator and winds through the evaporator coils until it exits the evaporator via a large suction line and returns back outside of your house to the motor compressor. It's very important to note that this is a sealed system carrying refrigerant, liquid, and gas. During my high school days, we used Freon 12 for refrigerators and Freon 22 for air conditioners. Today, they have been replaced by a more environmentally friendly R410 refrigerant for most air conditioners. It's also important to note that this is a continuous coil line where the R410 refrigerant is pumped throughout the line by the motor compressor housed inside your outside condenser. For my technical explanation of an air conditioner's theory of operation, I would like to start here at this expansion valve. Highly compressed refrigerant R410 enters here into the right side of the expansion valve. It's important to note that R410 is a very efficient heat transfer substance which boils at minus 55 degrees Fahrenheit. As it passes through the expansion valve, it is metered and compressed additionally until it leaves the expansion valve and sprays as a very high pressure liquid out into this low pressure evaporator chamber of coiled lines. As this happens, the R410 boils and transfers into a gas. Once again, R410 is a very cold substance boiling at minus 55 degrees Fahrenheit. As its liquid molecules pass from a liquid to a gas state, the molecules spread apart and absorb heat. 
This endothermic process is mathematically described and estimated by the ideal gas law, where P is pressure, V volume, N is the number of molecular moles, or simply stated, amount of substance, R is the ideal gas constant, and T is temperature. As I said, this is a sealed system where V volume is fixed or constant. You also have a constant amount of refrigerant, so N is constant. In addition, R, the ideal gas constant, stays the same. Consequently, as pressure significantly drops, temperature drops also. The walls of the evaporator coil then become very cold. The air conditioner evaporator fan blows air over them into your air conditioner ducts and vents throughout the house. The R410 continues winding through the evaporator coils absorbing additional BTUs of heat until it exits through a large suction line in this area. Please note that BTUs or British thermal units measure amounts of energy. One BTU increases the temperature of a pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. With respect to the evaporator we are dealing with negative BTUs that decrease the temperature. Per the upper left schematic with all this heat energy absorbed, the refrigerant R410 continues flowing through the suction line outside of your house into the motor compressor within the condenser. At this time the R410 is significantly compressed and exits the compressor here through this discharge line. At this point the R410 is a very hot liquid and once again its temperature change is governed by the ideal gas law. With significant increases in pressure the temperature of the R410 refrigerant also increases. As a hot liquid passes through the condenser, the condenser fan motor pulls cooler outside ambient air into and through the condenser coils. This dissipates the BTUs of heat captured from inside your house to the top of the condenser and substantially cools the R410. The cycle repeats. The R410 refrigerant is pumped through the sealed refrigeration lines to the expansion valve where it is metered, compressed, and sprayed out into the evaporator. Its molecules absorb heat and significantly cool the evaporator coils again. The evaporator's fan blows air over the coils, which further cools the living area in your house. Continuing through the suction line, the refrigerant enters into the motor compressor where it is once again compressed and leaves as a hot liquid through this discharge line. It then passes through the condenser coil with outside ambient air cooling the R410 as it exits the condenser and moves to the expansion valve again. The cycle continues until your home's thermostat senses that its cool setting has been reached and shuts off the power to the motor compressor. When the house warms to its threshold temperature again, the thermostat senses this and restarts the air conditioner. Similar to an air conditioner, most refrigerators displace heat from inside of its refrigeration and freezer compartments to the kitchen area outside the refrigerator cabinet. In addition, automobile air conditioners similarly displace heat from inside your car to the outside air through the engine's radiator system. This refrigeration process also applies to wine coolers and commercial refrigerator freezers and air conditioners. It's important to note that the second law of thermodynamics does not allow heat to transfer from a cooler body to a hotter area by itself without some work input. This law is easier to understand if you think of it as only allowing things to naturally transfer from a higher state to a lower state. For example, if you experience a tire blowout, its air pressure will quickly move from a high pressure state inside the tire to the lower pressure ambient air surrounding the car. With respect to heat transfer, a hot cup of coffee admits heat to the surrounding air. It does not collect heat from the surrounding air and move it back into the coffee cup. Consequently, transferring cold liquid to a hot area requires work. As I mentioned, our cool refrigerant moves from a cold area when it exits the evaporator into the compressor and follow on hot condenser coil which is a warm, warmer area. In this case our air conditioner motor compressor applies the work required to this system to transfer heat from a cold body to a hotter area. On a very hot day most people run their air conditioner constantly which requires huge amounts of work by their air conditioner motor compressors. They in turn consume large amounts of electrical energy which are reflected in their summertime power bills. In some cases, during extreme heat, populated areas will overload the electric grid and this thermodynamic work requirement causes major power outages. This concludes this episode on how an air conditioner works. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and select the YouTube bell so YouTube will notify you of all my new projects immediately after I publish them. At this time, I'm moving on to my next project. You're more than welcome to follow. 
In addition, if you have a great project that you want to post on my YouTube channel, email me some pictures and a brief description of it. If it qualifies for the Let's Fix It Right standards to help others, I'll interview you over the phone as a guest do-it-yourselfer, produce a high-quality video, and post it on my Let's Fix It Right channel. For the year following this posting, I'll share 50% of the potential YouTube benefits with you. If you have any subject matter requests or recommendations, please contact me. All of this said, I recommend that you subscribe to my channel, follow my projects, and save a bundle of money doing it.